cries neath the deepening sky. Watching. Hello, Norma. Hello, Barbara. <laughs> I'm very happy and honored to, to have this um, interview with you today. We know since a long time, very long time now. Yes, I can't remember when it was exactly. I think you it was the year. in the 90s, but I mm. don't know the, the exact year. In Belfast. Yeah, in Belfast. <laughs> and the, the troubles were still going on then. Yeah, because absolutely. I remember we, it was a concert we did in Belfast and somebody said, make sure you find out a quick way to get out just in case Really? You need an escape. It maybe that was a year you weren't there, I don't know, but... Um, I came twice, so yeah. I don't exactly know when. I think I went three so, times or four times, I'm not sure, but anyway. But anyway, I know it was, that, I know it was during the Troubles. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was really, I have to say that for me, this, this... To meet you at that time was just an opening and it was so important for me and it, it mm. still is, I mean, in the whole career I have since since then, it's just the the this encounter was really wow. like so important <laughs> in the yeah. in the music I decided to to follow and the musical mm. style I decided to follow. So you mean you hadn't decided then? No, 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 no. Oh. When I came, it was I was just totally open really? to everything. I'm still open. Yes. I hope. Yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's so, interesting. I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't realise that. Really? No, I don't think so. I mean, people came for all kinds of reasons. Yes, of you course. Know, like a, um, you know, some people already knew what they wanted to do and, um, and some, well, I don't know, some just went for kind of a enjoyable holiday or something. I don't know. For me it was like <laughs> not, wasn't a holiday. no holiday at all. It <laughs> <No>. was just... <laughs> <laughs> and Kenny... Wheeler Kenny was Willow there. was there, and that, so many yeah. incredible musician, musicians were there. It was really an amazing mm. time for me. I was at that time studying with uh, David Links in Brussels, <gasps> and so it was also a very good combination for yes, me yeah. to have those two point of view. So could you introduce yourself in a few words? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... Uh, Norma Winstone, known as a jazz singer, um, and I, but I, I don't know, I, I sometimes wonder about uh, labels, I don't like them, but um, I guess I am a jazz singer, mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested in all kinds of music, you know, I like a lot of classical music, um, never wanted to sing it, I probably don't have the equipment, but I, I didn't study it. Um, because it's not what I wanted to sing. Um, I was influenced heavily by Frank Sinatra. He was the first singer that I remember hearing because my parents liked him. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was, um, during the war, he was in the Eighth Army, um, you know, Mo Montgomery's, one of Mo Montgomery's Desert Rats. And <laughs> he heard Sinatra on field radio and wrote to my mother and said, you have to hear this singer. And because both my parents were interested in, in well, all kinds of music, really. Okay. You know, they would go and see an, an opera. They had no money, but they, you could get in very, very cheaply in these, what well, if you stood at the back or very, very bad seats. But they would sometimes go to see the, the you know, like Puccini or Verdi or some, somebody, you know. But they, they loved jazz. I mean, they loved, um, yeah, um, Ella Fitzgerald and, you know, Oscar Peterson. And mm -hmm. They just loved music. That they, and apparently they used to go and see the Hot Club of France when they were, uh, before they were married, when they were teenagers. And the Hot Club of France, with Stefan Grappelli, Django Reinhardt, came to the East End of London, mm -hmm. which is where they lived. And um, they, they would go and see them. So, yeah, so it was natural somehow that I just followed what they, what they liked. You know, they, they more or less, I suppose, um, 
what they were interested in. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would hear. Mm -hmm. so. But it was all on the radio. We had no record playing equipment. So, so everything, everything I heard okay. was through the radio. Okay. So. And was it, uh, was it a way for you to, to learn music also? Um, well, it was a, a way to learn not songs. Aware. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I obviously, immediate, I loved songs. I loved those, the great American songbook, you know. Um, and my mother knew a lot of them anyway. Yeah. She, she had a good voice. She used to sing at family parties and everything. And, and um, she, I, if I heard a song I liked, I, I would say, oh, what, what's the second verse of that? And she would often know the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And so I learnt things just by listening. Um, and my grandmother had a piano, in it, because we lived in the same house as my grandmother. Um, and she had a piano. And most, most people in those days in the East End of London, which was where I was born, had a piano. Okay. That was their, they made their own entertainment. That's you know. incredible, yeah. And uh, so, so there was always someone who could just play a tune. And my dad played just by ear. He'd never been taught that mm -hmm. piano was a thing. He really would, liked, would have liked me to be a pianist. But, um, and, uh, and they... I had lessons when I was about um, seven, I think, S uh, seven, between seven and eight. They, they asked me if I wanted to less, some lessons on piano, so I said yes. I'm not sure whether I really did, but mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. anyway, I, I learnt for about 18 months. And then the lady that came to the house to teach me um, was having a baby. Yeah. And and she couldn't come, and, and I couldn't go to her house. We had no transport or anything. So that's all. I just had these 18 months of piano lessons. Um, and uh, then we moved to Dagenham in Essex. And it was really only that I had a teacher, a class teacher, who recognised that I was musical. And, and she, she said, you should take this exam, you know, to get a scholarship. Yeah. And I said, oh, I, I don't have a teacher. Uh, and she said, stay behind after school. Mm -hmm. and I will teach you. Oh. She said, choose some music from what you were playing when you were having lessons. And uh, she helped me. She coached me. Wow. And I took the first exam I got through and then the second one. And I had to sing to get in. I found myself going to Trinity College of Music in London for an audition. And I had to sing. But it didn't occur to me to take singing. I could have taken singing as a second study, probably, yeah. but I didn't because that's not the way I wanted to sing. You know, I still wanted to sing like Frank Sinatra <laughs> and and Lena or Lena Horne. Mm -hmm. She was another one. When I was about eight, I saw her in a film. Yeah, called Words and Music, um, which was uh, all the music of Rogers and Hart, mm -hmm. and she came on, and she was so. Beautiful, I couldn't believe it. I was just sat there absolutely in love with her. And um, I said, and she sang, The Lady is a Tramp. And I said to my mum at the end of the film, can you get me that song? I want to learn that song. So she got me the music and um, I learned it. And I, I used to sing it at family parties. <laughs> How old were you? Oh, about eight. Okay. And, um, and also, I, I absolutely fell in love with If I Loved You from Carousel. A cousin of mine who was about eight or nine years older than me, she took me to see the show in London. Mm -hmm. And, of course, You'll Never Walk Alone. That was the big yeah. Yeah, hit from it. Um, but I loved If I Loved You. That was a favourite of mine. So that was another one. I don't know what my dad played. I don't know how he found what to play mm -hmm. on the piano but we every year like we do for the rest of the family we do a little performance um but still we had no as i say we had no record playing equipment yeah. it, everything was from the radio um and uh eventually i did get a record player and started off with 78. so that's really mm -hmm. how you you began to learn yes songs and mm. Um, 
But I never really needed the music to learn the songs because I just, I was singing things I'd heard. Mm -hmm. It was only later that being able to read music became very useful. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I joined various bands and they had music. And, and um, so I had to read. And it was unusual in those days for singers to read. Um, I mean, now it's, it's amazing that the level of education for singers now, well, for everybody now, but when I started, there were, there were no schools. And when I was coming up, all through my teens, there was no school where you could go to learn about jazz or about any singing other than show singing you yeah. know, or classical singing. Um, but I was lucky because I found somebody, someone told me there was a singing teacher when I was about 17, I think, mm -hmm. 16 or 17, and I went to him and he played piano, never heard him sing. I think he was a saxophone player. Yeah. And the first thing he said was, right, breathe. And I went, <laughs> no. So he said, I'm going to teach you how to breathe properly for singing. And so he taught me about using the diaphragm and gave me long note exercises and snatching breath exercises, mm -hmm. you know, how you could quickly take a breath and uh, almost like sucking it in. I didn't know whether any of this was right, but it was the only instruction that I had, so I practiced it. And um, and he began to, he knew people who had bands. Mm -hmm. And so he started to get me some gigs. Okay. But I didn't like them. There were weddings and functions. And okay. I, uh, mm -hmm. And I'd heard jazz and I was already changing the melodies, you know, and getting my collection of, of uh, songs that I wanted to sing. Um, so it was really in, in the tradition. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, everything was in the tradition um, until I heard uh, Dave Brubeck Quartet mm -hmm. with J Paul Desmond. And I thought, wow, this is really... I mean, you know, I'd, I'd heard Oscar Peterson yeah. and um, I'd also um, heard Ella, of course, mm -hmm. doing scat singing, which yeah. I tried to copy because yeah. I wondered what she would what she was doing. It seemed pretty obvious to me because I had a good ear so I could follow what she was doing. But I played these things so much that I learnt them. And then the, the, the first non-vocal jazz I think that I heard was Dave Brubeck yeah. and Jazz Impressions of the USA. I mean everybody heard Take Five, you know, eventually. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. uh, I think this was before then. And I didn't know they were improvising. I, what Paul Desmond played was so singable, mm -hmm. clear, that I just thought it was written. And I, I listened and listened, and I learnt his solos. Um, no, I didn't by try. Copying, by yeah, copying. Just by copying. Yeah, just for copying. And then I, I, I heard Kind of Blue, mm -hmm. Miles Davis, and that was it, really. I just was completely taken over by this music yeah, and wondered how a voice, I thought how satisfying to be in a music like that for a voice, but I had no idea how it yeah. could happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I just thought it would be wonderful if it could, because I'd heard Bebop, you know, I heard Charlie Parker and, and, and Dizzy Gillespie, and I loved that stuff, and, and I, I loved the the melodies, but I never really wanted to improvise over those sort of changes. changes Probably yeah. they were too difficult. Mm. <laughs> That's why. But you know, you got sort of chord changes like every every um, couple of beats. Yeah. Um, but with this <laughs> modal music, it's open, and I thought, wow, this is more like the French, like Debussy and and Ravel, and that that, that impressionistic music that. I loved mm -hmm. and um, but so that was there I didn't know what how I could ever be involved yeah. in anything like that 
except I thought, well, maybe if you wrote words to those kind of tunes, maybe that would be a way in to that music. Okay. But I didn't. <laughs> I still carried on looking for unusual songs. Yeah. You know, um, I remember finding Lazy Afternoon in a shop. Suddenly saw this, and I'd heard June Christie sing. I had the record of June Christie. Um, it was all kind of ballads and string writing. Um, and, uh, and she sang Lazy Afternoon, which I fell in love with. And suddenly and there you was the music. recorded later. Yeah, I did, yeah, much later. Yes, much later. But um, yeah, so I used to sing, I got grabbed that music and yeah. thought, wow, this is fantastic. And Because it was hard, really, to find anything unusual. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to know all this. Yes, of course. No, I mean, I don't know if this is what your... I'm interesting, interested by anything going to be you, about. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Of it's course, just, it's, 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 been, been, it's your background. It's been so. quite a long life, you see, so there's, it's, so it's, there's it's a lot perfect. to say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, apart, you know, I had these gigs and I didn't like them, so mm -hmm. I stopped. I thought, no, if I have to do that, I don't want to sing. It's not what I want to sing. Okay. And, uh, but I then set about trying to collect songs mm -hmm. that I could sing if I ever found the right people. Oh, okay. And... Um, and eventually I met, you know, I, I did meet people. I went, went to this uh, pub near me where there was a nice little trio playing. Yeah. And I sat in, I had my, uh, what did I sing? Love a Man and Yesterdays, I used to sing. Yeah. And uh, I sat in and their singer, they had a singer, a male singer, and he was leaving. And they said, would you like to do two nights a week with us? And so I started to meet people who came in there and then somebody else, a pianist I used to play with, um, I'm not sure how I met him, but um, through friends, I don't know, and Chris Goody. Um, and he knew somebody who wrote lyrics. Yeah. Um, and um, he came up with some lyrics for Naima. Um, through through her, um, oh God, well, no, da, 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 of course I know her name. She wrote she wrote the words that I sing to in your own sweet way, and um, and some other time, no, some some time ago some that time I sing ago. on mm -hmm. on somewhere called home. I will think. I, I apologise <laughs> if you ever see this. I know her very well. But the name's it called. Will, it will come it will back. Come back. Don't worry. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and, and other things, like in your own sweet way, she'd written words to that. Although there are words, I think, by Mrs. Brubeck, but I'd mm -hmm. never heard them. And um, so I started to get a little repertoire together. And um, Joy Spring, I heard Oscar Peterson play Joy Spring, and I thought, wow, what a piece. And a guy that I was with at the time wrote some words for it. Okay. And I helped with one or two lines. And... Um, yeah, so I used to I used to sing that, and um, yeah, just and various unusual Billie Holiday tunes I'd, I'd heard on the radio, and I don't know. Well, it, she sang. There, there were some things that I heard her sing that were not like the usual um, mm -hmm. standards, which which I I loved. Ella doing um, my first first album I ever bought. I saved up for was Ella and Louie. Yeah. I know, can't we be friends? And isn't this a love day? Isn't this a lovely day to be caught in the rain? <laughs> and I just thought it was delightful. I, I loved it. And Oscar Peterson's playing on that swung. So he hardly plays anything, but it swings like crazy. And um, the next one was Frank Sinatra, Only the Lonely. And somewhere along the line was the Dave Brubeck. Um, jazz impressions of the USA and Miles, kind of blue, and uh, but anyway, so I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd I'm beginning to know a lot of things other than the usual standards, and then mm -hmm. I heard Billy Holiday on the radio singing, um, I don't want to cry anymore. I don't know if you know that song. So, I don't know how it's going. Each day, just about sunset. 
I watch you passing my door. It's all I can do not to run to you, but I don't want to cry anymore. I don't know where, how I managed to get hold of, of it, but I used to sing it. I sang it at my first ever gig at Ronnie's, Ronnie Scott's. That and a thing called A Weep No More. I think that was Carmen McRae used to sing that. And I probably got my friendly pianist that I was telling, talking about earlier on, Chris Goody, he probably took them down, probably transcribed them, because yeah. I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could read notes, but I didn't know really about chords, mm -hmm. how you named them. Um, but I'm, I got the music from somewhere. <laughs> so I imagine it was a pianist that I was playing with at the time. Um, but yeah, it was really, I was really trying to collect unusual songs. Yeah. Um, and eventually, I, of course, I, I, I was trying to run a club with this guy that wrote the lyrics to Joy Spring. And um, we ran this club together and we booked guests every week. It was in the East End of London. It was actually owned by the Cray Twins, who you, you wouldn't know about, but they were notorious gangsters okay. in London. <laughs> um, but I didn't know this. I mm -hmm. very You had green. this opportunity to, to yeah, go and play. To use, yes, to use this course. room, because yeah. the guy behind the bar liked <laughs> jazz. And um, so we, we had this thing every week, and we booked Ian Carr one week, and a trumpeter yeah. who wrote the... He also a very good writer, he wrote the book, mm -hmm. a book about Miles Davis, two books I think, and one about Keith Jarrett. And he was, he was very kind, very lovely. Um, and he said, oh, you should sing with the new jazz orchestra. So, because as long as, uh, apart from booking a guest, we always played, I, yeah. I sang, you know. Yes, yes. So he introduced me to Neil Ardley, mm -hmm. who was very influenced by Gil Evans and was transcribing a lot of the, the Gil Evans arrangements for this new jazz orchestra. And, excuse me. <coughs> I think that's it, I think. And, um, and Michael Garrick was on piano with that band. At one time, it was John Heisman was on drums, you mm -hmm. know, Coliseum fame, before he formed Coliseum, and Barbara Thompson, and Mike Gibbs was in the band on trombone. All kinds of people were in it. And um, uh, Henry Lowther, I think, was one of the trumpet players. Who, and I, don't, I didn't know any of them until I, yeah. I did this mm -hmm. gig, you know, apart from Ian. And um, so uh, I, Michael said, Oh, Michael Garrick, I've got these songs I've written. Um, would you like to have a look at them? So he gave me the songs. I took them home and I, I looked at them, learnt mm -hmm. one or two of them. And I went to a gig that he was doing with his sextet. And he said, uh, would, you, would you like to sit in and sing one of the songs? Wow. So I did. Yeah. And then I was about to just go and sit back in the audience. And he said, no, stay, uh, stay on it and join in the next piece. Well, the next piece was, um, I think it was probably Temple Dancer or something. It was, it was in 10. It was an unusual time <laughs> signature for me. 10-8, um, I think. And Not only for you. No, well, it's just <laughs> unusual. For anybody <laughs> at the time, yeah. Um, and there were no words. And I think it was just one chord, more or less, you improvise okay. it. So I thought, well, oh, okay. So I did a wordless mm -hmm. improvisation. And at the end of the evening, you know, the lineup of his band was two saxophones and trumpet, a piano, bass, drums. And he said, well, one of the saxophone players is leaving. Would you like to join the band and sing the saxophone lines? Okay. So I thought, wow, this is really... Good. And, and of course, I had to do everything mm -hmm. in the key that it was in. It was no question of, oh, we change this key yeah. because you can't reach that note. Because <laughs> I'd said to him, oh, that's a bit high. Well, you just have to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, 
you know, I did a bit more long note, long note practicing and uh, going up and trying to get my voice higher because I, I thought I could only sing up to about middle C. Okay. After that, I thought, oh no, it's a bit, it's like the F below middle C to the C above middle mm -hmm, C. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of songs the, 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 just, were yeah, in that kind yeah. of range because mm -hmm. um, they're always written high on the on the music, but you always had to take them down about a fourth yeah. to, for the female singer's key. Um, so, but I thought, well, I'm not singing words when I'm singing this, so it was easier. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly found that I could, I had more of a range than I thought. <laughs> and um, and then Mike Westbrook asked me if I'd join his band and asked me to do a, a track on Metropolis and um, wordless track and then he formed this band called Earthrise you know it was just after we landed mm -hmm. on the moon and um, there was a, a fantastic uh, picture of the earth rising you know from yeah. a scene from the moon and he formed a, a band and, and we did his pieces and uh, some of them had words and some didn't um, and at the same time, I'd been going to some free sesh, free music sessions. Okay. Um, because John Stevens heard me. In fact, I sang I Don't Want to Cry Anymore. <laughs> with This pianist that I knew was playing a gig in a club with John Stevens on drums. Mm -hmm. And I went and sat in and John said, I'm going to speak to Ronnie Scott. He obviously knew Ronnie, but I didn't. And he said, I see if I can get you an audition. And so he spoke to Ronnie Scott and said, yeah, he'll give you an audition. Um, and he fixed me up to rehearse with Gordon Beck, mm -hmm. who was a star, you know, mm -hmm. I, I loved his playing. And Jeff Klein, who was another star, he'd played with uh, Tubby Hayes and Ronnie Scott and Stan Tracy. And, um, and they're all people I'd heard at, the, at Ronnie Scott's old place, you know, in Gerrard Street. Um, that was before the new club opened. And um, so John said that, you know, we'll, we'll get together. So we got together, rehearsed, we got a few tunes that we could do at the, the audition. The audition went, pff, it didn't happen. It went months and months and months. And eventually I just went and spoke to Ronnie Scott. I don't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do it now, but I must have been <laughs> in that sort of, you know, that thing of the sort of, what's it, the enthusiasm of youth. And I just said to him, um, do you not want English singers in your club? And he looked at me and he said, why, why do you say that? And I said, well, because you never had an English singer in your club. <laughs> You've had Americans. And even Cleo Lane had not been there, who was okay. the most famous English yeah. jazz singer. And he, he said, well, well, why? I said, no, you promised an audition about eight months ago through John Stevens, and, and you haven't ever come through with it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, can I, can I sit in? And Stan Tracy was playing. And he said, no. Um, no. No. He said, I don't think he's the right pianist for you anyway. I said, you never heard me. So you don't, how could you say? He said, no, you're, you're be, you'd be better with Gordon Beck. See, so he said, I promise, I, sit down. I promise I will give you an audition. And he did. Okay. But John Stevens, by this time, had discovered free music. So he didn't want to play time anymore. Okay. <laughs> so... I said, well, we'll have to do the audition with someone else. And mm -hmm. Okay, so Gordon Beck said, oh, don't worry. He said, there's a drummer. He's just come down from up north. He'll do it with us. It was Tony Oxley. Okay. You know, I mean, he, well, he wasn't legendary at the time, but he, no, no, no. he became so and as a, as a free player. But his time playing was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And he was playing time at the time. And so he did the audition. So it was Gordon, Jeff Klein, and, uh, and Tony Oxley. And we did Joy Spring, and I don't know what else we did, but anyway, Ronnie gave me four weeks there. Wow. Because at that time, people used to play for a month at a time. Ah, that's amazing. I know. Yeah. I was on 
cloud nine. But, um, <laughs> but so John Stevens, I, I was still in touch with him and he used to set up um, free music sessions, I think every mm -hmm. Saturday. And he said, would you come, come along to one of these? Might be interesting. And it was, I went and I think Dave Holland came to one or two. He was, that's before he went off to join Miles Davis. Yes. And there were all, a lot of the young um, musicians who'd come to London from all over the country. And Kenny was there, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know him really. I'd, I'd yeah. heard his music and I loved it. You know, I'd heard Windmill Tilter, which was wonderful. And piece of writing and playing and everything. But anyway, so I, 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 he was there and we didn't really speak because Ken didn't speak much to anybody. You know, <laughs> it was very quiet. But I was very impressed with what he played in that free context. It all made sense, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it was a very good thing to do. I would recommend to do, singers to do it, to try a bit of free music. You know, when mm -hmm. I've done workshops, I've often got people to come and just sing something with the pianist. Yeah. I mean, depending on how good the pianist mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. it's assigned to you on these things. It can really work sometimes. And because you have to think, you have to, as a singer, you, you haven't got any, you have to make an input. So you have to come up with ideas. Or be influenced by the ideas that you're list of the per person you're playing with, yes. um, and I think it's a very good thing to do, um, you know, for the ear and for everything, and also for confidence and for thinking. Well, yeah, I've got something to say, mm -hmm. whether it's good or not. You know, I can try it out. Yeah. So it was a good, it was a good experience that, and then Kenny suddenly said, could I do a broadcast with his big band? Mm. I think he used to get one or two a year for the BBC. And he said, I'll do, I'll do an arrangement of a standard for you, if you like. I okay. think he did, I'll never be the same. Um, and he also had another singer on, on one of these broadcasts, um, a West Indian singer called Bobby Breen, who was singing with the John Dankworth band. Mm -hmm. He was a very nice singer, Bobby. Very good. And, um, and Kenny liked him. And I think Bobby sang God Bless the Child or something. Anyway, whatever. Then he eventually asked me to do another broadcast with him. And this time, um, I was written in with the band. So it was pretty hard because I don't have perfect pitch. Okay. And nobody ever thought, I don't think, well... How's she going to get her notes? And she just. <laughs> so I used to had my own kind of, uh, you know, method. Yeah. Which was, I think, well, I've, I've got, say, 16 bars of rest there. There's something else going on. And I have to come in here, you know, on a B or something. Where, mm -hmm. where am I going to get that from? And so I would listen to what they played in the, the section where I wasn't singing. And. I think, what can, what's the tonality I can hear? Because Kenny never wrote in keys, mm -hmm. never key signatures. Mm -hmm. Because obviously the chords were changing they were all course, the time. Yeah. They were moving mm. through different harmonic yeah. spheres. And so I would think, hmm, what do I, oh, I can hear, hmm, I'd sing the note to myself that was dominant to me. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go to the piano find out what Checking. it was and then I'd write down here an A or an F or whatever yes. it is and from that I would be able to pitch yeah. for the note that I had to come in with. It's great. Yeah. Often I was with somebody but it might be second alto and, mm -hmm, and you, mm -hmm. you or something you know he'd say with second alto and I think well yeah, but I, I, don't I can't know. hear. No I don't know which one uh -huh. that is. Um, because with 19 people playing, it's <laughs> difficult, isn't it? Um, but anyway, it, I got away with it. That's how I felt about the beginning. Mm -hmm. I got away with it. And then um, he asked me to do more. <laughs> and, and of course, then eventually when, um, when we formed Azimuth, 
Well, I'd, I'd worked with Kenny anyway, apart from that, you know. Um, I got to make um, Edge of Time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, I, I got as many of my friends in on that as I could. You know, many of the musicians I'd been working with. Um, and John did all the arrangements for that. And, and, and he, he had his trio, which was Chris Lawrence on bass and Tony Levin on drums which was an incredible trio. And someone said to me once, does anybody ever play one, the first beat, the bar? And I don't think so. I mean, they all heard it, but nobody ever played it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was great. And then, of course, John formed his sextet that Pen Kenny was part of, and Stan Saltzman and Chris Pine. Um, and uh, anyway, so they were all kind of involved on them. Um, on my album Edge of Time, and um, and then and then with the, the forming of Azimuth, and, you know, so I had a lot of, of connection with Kenny mm -hmm. and John. Of course, well, we were married at the time. Oh, okay. Um, and then eventually had children, two children, and um, yeah, I mean, it was a very very productive time, but yeah. I guess you have to be careful that you're not always thinking, looking through like rose-coloured glasses because I was young yeah. and you're enthusiastic and there was mm -hmm. a lot of, there was a lot going on. There probably is a lot going on now that I'm not part of mm -hmm. anymore, you know, but I was very much part of all the things that were going on and I, I loved it, you know. Mm -hmm. John Sermon and, and, you know, writing stuff and... And John Taylor, you know, was involved with a lot of these things that were going on. Things even that I wasn't involved in. But, um, yeah, it was a very vibrant scene. And, and nobody thought, I mean, all the musicians just seemed to take it for granted that I, I would be able to sing words or I didn't, don't have to sing words. Mm -hmm. um, but... I think I was telling you when we were talking once before about having been very influenced by American singers. Yeah. Of course. So all the great singers in that music mm -hmm. were from America. Um, and I, obviously, I suppose I learnt songs from them singing them, hearing them uh, sing. And, and so I sang with a voice that was very influenced by American accent, I think. Yeah. Like a lot of people do, when they sing standards, they sing with an American accent. And it's perfectly acceptable. Although Cleo Lane, who I talked about yesterday, yeah. she always sang with an English accent. <laughs> you know, whatever she sang, she did. Um, it was assumed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she sang in English <laughs> and, um, and I didn't even think about it until singing Michael Garrick's songs, the ones that he wrote and mm -hmm. said, could you learn them? I sang them and they were written by an English person. The, the words were written by, you know, with, with a very uh, English sort of literary background, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he was very into literature and, um, so I just sang them, I suppose. I didn't even think I just sang them like me. Yeah. It was just after that, when I was back singing a standard again, I suddenly came to a word which I would have <laughs> sung, um, like it was, you might have sang, I could have danced all night. And suddenly, I couldn't, not that I ever sang that, but you know, something like that. I wouldn't have been, I could have done, Danced, danced. I, I, sing, I say danced, not danced. If I came from north of England, I might say danced. Okay. But it wouldn't be danced. It would be di danced. Okay. It would be, you know, it would be <laughs> slightly different. But and I realised, oh. This what is, am I doing? <laughs> yeah. This is not me. This is someone else's voice yeah. coming through me. Um, I mean, it wasn't a big revelation or anything, but I, it made me think. 
Mm -hmm. And so I somehow wasn't able to sing after that with an American accent. Although people have said to me, oh yes, it, you, you do sing. You do sing like an American. Oh, really? Yeah, like an American. I don't know whether I do. I mean, I, I have the big, big influence in sound for me mm -hmm. was Sinatra. And of course, you can't be more American. But his was never exaggerated. His diction was always marvellous. Yeah. And, and he... And the American accent was not exaggerated except in things like uh, if it was my way or, you know, New York, New York, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. I never really, th I, I didn't consider that as Frank Sinatra, so not for me, you know, the songs I loved were the songs for swinging lovers and only the lonely and all the ballads that he sang absolutely convincingly mm -hmm. to me because well, mm -hmm. he was a good actor. <laughs> um, um, and I never thought about that, because that was him, that was his voice. And it was the sound of his voice that really, I think, got me. Just that sound, it sort of somehow went straight to my stomach. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. Sometimes I hear him, and it's, it's a surprise. You know, I wasn't thinking I was going to hear it. And it suddenly he comes on, and it's like, whew, you know, mm -hmm. just so... Well, that's, that's me, you know, I just uh, was... was uh, fell in love with it from the time I could remember, you know, with that sound. And, um, yeah. Well, I, I'm aware that for you the sound is so important. Were you aware that with Azimuth, the, you were really creating something new? Well, I think we were aware because, yeah. um, because it got some strange reaction, you know, from critics. Oh. At times, and um, I think there weren't, and it was obvious that, that it wasn't a usual lineup for mm -hmm. the music we had played, um, and which was jazz. But some people said it; they didn't think it was jazz. But we'd all come from jazz backgrounds, so you know, I don't know really what else, it, how else you could call it, you know, really. Um, and I guess there were. That's another thing people said, oh, it's, it's they're influ influenced by Terry Riley and um, Steve Reich. I, I don't think John, I'm not sure that he heard Steve Reich mm -hmm. at the time. But That's but, incredible because it's really like in the same atmosphere and it's yes. really like so obvious when we listen to Azimuth that Steve Reich is... Is in there. there? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, well, maybe I, I'm wrong, but I mean, I don't think John thought of anything like he wrote the pieces, but of course, uh, um, I suppose you know because of the lineup, mm -hmm. he had to play a lot of mm -hmm. things, you yeah. know, rhythmic things, and and or keep sustain ostinato things, so that would sound a bit like yes, yes. Steve Reich. But we had uh, solos going on over the top. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe he had heard him, but I don't... He always seemed a bit surprised when... So it must be like that. I think it so. Was just... Yeah. But, um, yeah, we were, I suppose, aware that it was different, but it was... I don't know, it was, it was lovely. It was, I, I so enjoyed singing those those lines and and the idea of of being able to sing in unison with Kenny, which of course I had done before a lot, but improvising with him as mm -hmm. well, alongside mm -hmm. him was, well, I don't know, it was just just wonderful, but um, I don't know. I think people would be more ready for it now than they were then. Yeah, because you prepared us to. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think of that. <laughs> right, yeah, but <laughs> um, I don't know. But you, I think you did ask me about sound. I don't know whether we got the answer to, um, to that question before we stopped. Because I said that I didn't like my sound. Yes, it's true. Until, no, I could never, I, I didn't think about it. I didn't concentrate on sound. But of course, when you listen to Azimuth, it's all, it all seems to be about sound. Yeah. Um, but... Um, I, I was, I had not really thought 
too much about how I sounded. I was mm -hmm. too, in the early days, I was too interested on, in, in a, being able to improvise. Um, it was only, as I, I think I said earlier, when I heard the playbacks of the first Azimuth album, I was amazed. I, I, I thought, well, oh, I, actually this sounds okay. I never sounded like this. And I think I, it was the first time I was recorded sympathetically and with a bit of reverb and help, yeah. you know. Um, and and there's a space around the voice as well, which was nice. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I, I liked it. And from then on, I thought, that is how I want to sound. And I think always singing, uh, you know, in unison with Kenny, I realised I was trying to match his sound. So I think all the time that was influencing the sound that I made, mm -hmm. um, trying to, I never wanted to stand out. I yeah. didn't want the voice to be like a separate <clears throat> thing, say like, I don't know who, but mm -hmm. the Ray Conniff singers or something, yeah. <laughs> where you've got this the voice, you know, really voicey kind of, I wanted yeah. it to be, I mean, it's, it's a sound, it's an instrument, yeah. and it is a sound, like an instrument, mm -hmm. but not any instrument that you can think of, it's just a voice. And voices all sound, they all sound different anyway. But just the idea that that voice could influence a whole sound or could be part of a whole sound, that's what I loved. Uh, yeah, I really what... feel that the, the roles in this project, the roles are changing from, from one person to the other one. It's yes. like someone is taking the lead and then the other one. Yes. And sometimes it's just no leader at all and it's kind of uh, mm. uh, unity. But you know, none of that was planned. No, no, no. I can imagine. It's just that we were used to each other. Yeah. And um, and it just happened. It was it was fortunate. perfect match. Yeah. And I mean, really, and it wasn't our, really our idea. Mm -hmm. um, it was Manfred Eicher's idea to put me and John with Kenny. That was a good it, idea. It was a very <laughs> good idea. Um, you know, because John went to him with a. A tape because there was no, uh, there was very little opportunity at, at one point in England mm -hmm. to record. So we thought, well, we have to do something. So we went into a studio and recorded some pieces. There were some things that um, that John had written words to. Uh, John had written the music, and I'd written words to. I think there was the odd standard, but uh, um, anyway, we were. He, John was ready to take that to record companies. Yeah. And he thought, well, Germany seems to be the place. And of course, ECM was at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Manfred knew about John from Kenny, because Kenny had recorded New High at that time okay. with Keith Jarrett. And I think actually <coughs> did originally want to have John, but Manfred said, well, I think we should have Keith, <laughs> so, which was a good move. <laughs> <laughs> another good, another good yeah. idea. <laughs> so... Um, so uh, anyway, it, at that po that stage, it seemed it was possible to get an interview with Manfred, and uh, Manfred Eicher, of course, that is. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was at the top of the list, and John was going off with this tape, you know, to play him and say, well, "Do you think we could record for yeah. you?" And he just the night before he left, he had just got this. Synthesizer, Synthi, yeah, AKS. Anyway, he was playing around with it, and he came up with a loop. And he just said to me, "Oh, sing over this. Just improvise over this." And I did. Um, I think he put a microphone in there or something. Anyway, he finished up with a recording of me singing over this loop. Really? Hmm. And when he played that to Manfred, that was the thing that really, Manfred said, oh, I can hear a flugel with the voice. Why don't you record with Kenny, just the three of you? So it was his idea to add Kenny. And of course it was a wonderful idea because we, we worked with him anyway and yeah. knew him very well. Yeah. Um, and loved his playing, of course. And um, so that's how it happened. And, That's incredible. Um, but you see, I mean, but Manfred Eicher has always had this thing about sound. 
I think it, it's it's almost, the sound is is more important than the music almost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, to to get a sound yeah. that somehow I don't know gets through to people. Um, I don't know how many people it got through to, but anyway, um, it it does. It, it's it was special. Yeah, and. Um, I'm very, I'm very proud to have been part of that, and you know. And still today, you keep this relationship with this label, with the yes. ECM, which yes. is like, yeah. yeah. You've got to find something that fits fits it. I mean, I, I do all kinds of things. I mean, I do some things that probably would not necessarily fit on the label, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um, you know, with the last trio that I had with uh, Glauco Venia and Klaus Gesing. Um, I think Manfred liked the sound of that. We made a recording, um, we just decided to do it. And, mm -hmm. <coughs> and I think Klaus was being interviewed on the radio in Germany and Manfred happened to hear it. And so he, he heard what we'd, some of what we'd recorded and I think he, he liked that. So when so I this approached one was not him, his ID. No, <laughs> no, it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. But uh, but he helped to keep it going this, by giving us these recordings, and um, we did four for him. And yeah, that was again. That, that was very different because people often try to compare the two uh, things. But I sing more words with with the that trio yeah. than I did with Azimuth. For some reason, I think with Azimuth, it was. It was John's music. It was, sometimes we played Kenny's music, mm -hmm. and some, very occasionally a piece by somebody else. But it was made. It was John's whole kind of I don't know ethos. It was his idea, and very much had his mark on it. And um, whereas, and and, and sometimes I felt that. It didn't need words. Uh, the, the music didn't need any words. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would add words, but often I just thought, no, it just, it's a sound. It just needs the sound of the voice. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, once you write words, then the piece becomes specific. It means this, mm. because those are the words you've written, and it's about this. Yeah. Um, whereas when it's wordless, it can be whatever you think it's about, mm -hmm. um, from the listener's point of view. So, so I, d you know, I didn't always want to write words. I mean, a lot of people automatically thought, "Oh, this is following on from ECM," but well, it was because they were big. They were big um, from Azimuth. They were big Azimuth fans anyway, mm -hmm. and they knew a lot of the stuff. They knew the, all the pieces from somewhere called home, and. Um, and we played those, and then gradually they introduced their pieces, and then, I don't know, I just felt that somehow, I mean, we do do things without words, but I don't know, somehow words seem to fit that lineup a bit more, so, but I don't, there's no real plan, there's mm -hmm. no, oh, this is, there are words because of this, or that, I don't know what it was, but it just seems to, but the words you are you are writing are really fitting the music. How do you work on the writing of the lyrics? Well, I always feel that the lyrics come out of the music. Mm -hmm. I don't really like to impose words on a piece of music. So I you rather, never do it? Well, I do, obviously. I suppose that's what I am doing. But But they come normally from listening over and over and over yeah. to a piece until a line comes out somewhere that feels good to sing yeah. and feels good with that musical mm -hmm. phrase. And sometimes it's in the middle of the song. Sometimes it's at the beginning. And having a title is helpful sometimes. Mm -hmm. Even if you change the title, to have something to start with is a help to try to get your mind into what this could be about. Um, and the thing is, I, I don't really, I would love to be able to write words like 
Joni Mitchell mm -hmm. would tell a story and set some kind of a scene between people. But my words never seem to come out like that. I can't seem to do that. But I seem to want to write words that could be ambiguous. You know, it could mean more than one thing. Mm -hmm. Or It's really like a poem. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Mm -hmm. People say it's poetry, but I think that the words... There's, there's another thing people have said, oh, why don't you publish a book of your words, like poems? But to me, they're not really poems. They're it's really connected to the music. Connected yeah. to the music. I suppose they do stand on their own, but mm -hmm. I don't know. For me, they, they came from the music. And maybe that's why they seem to fit... You know, and I never like words of uh, where people just write enough syllables to fit mm -hmm. the notes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, to me, it's got to be like there's a phrase yeah. in music. And so does it mean that sometimes you, you the, the music has to change to fit your words? Or is you, it like no, you really... Usually not. No. Um, because when I, I've written a lot of words to Steve Swallow's pieces and he said, oh, by the way, feel free if you need to change yeah. the melody or you need to change a rhythm or something. I hardly have ever done that. Mm. I don't know. I, I always try to fit whatever the music was in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I might have to put in an extra note or something yeah. because there's a, an extra word I need in there or something or miss out the note because there isn't a word for it yeah. but mostly it, they, they're very close to the original melody I hope mm. you know because very I think it's very important I, I feel sometimes people treat it very lightly writing words oh, oh yeah we, oh, I want to sing some words to this and yeah oh that will fit and that and and I'm not left with any feeling of what the thing's about, mm -hmm. either the music mm -hmm. or the words. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's really got to be a, a real mix of words and music. Yeah. Um, and if, if it doesn't seem right for words, well then, don't write any words. <laughs> Yeah, and then you sing it uh, yeah. instrumentally. Yeah. And do you sometimes um, sing also in other languages than English? Well, sometimes in Italian, <laughs> I, I know. In the Friulian dialect, yes. I, I did a lot, did a whole <laughs> evening of, of things with uh, Glauco's, um, his reworkings of folk songs from the yeah. region. And um, we, we did a thing with an orchestra um, and that I really enjoyed that. I, I like singing in that language. There are a couple of them on on the ECM yeah. albums. Um, Gusta e si viva, you know, that sort of. I think the lust for life, you know, mm -hmm. or, or well, that's the only way I can describe it. Gusta e si viva, um, and uh, the other one, which was a um, a poem by um, Pasolini, mm -hmm. who was from the region where Glauco lives. Mm -hmm. And um, it just happened that Glauco realised that that poem fitted a piece by Sati. Oh. Eric Sati. And so we put the, he put the two together. Oh, wow. But, um, and that's called Chant. Mm. Delis Champanis. Um, anyway, but yeah, but that that's really the only time. Well, many many years ago, I, I did sing in on. You know, I used to do studio work, and I once did a duet with Roger Whittaker in French. Mm -hmm. And it's funny we did it for Canada, and then we had to do a, a version with slightly better French for the. Uh, French market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had to improve my French <laughs> pronunciation. But um, I'm trying to think if I... Oh, I once sang in Welsh. 
can you imagine? Which was Michael Garrick. We had a, a gig at the Ice Deadford, which yeah. is a big Welsh festival. And I thought, I'm going to get killed here. I'm gonna get, they're going to lynch me or something. I, but anyway, it was old Welsh. Mm -hmm. And somebody made a recording so, so that I could hear it. That's all I can remember. <laughs> it's a long time ago. But um, uh, I, I do like it. I quite like the idea of singing in, <coughs> in other languages. But um, And I only also once did a thing. I wanted to sing a Jobim tune yeah. in Zingara or Retrato. Mm. In, to a blank too beautiful or, yeah mm. and i'd written words to it in english yeah in english oh. and i recorded them for manhattan in the rain yeah and then i thought i'd better try to get permission mm -hmm. well jobim was dead by this time and i didn't get anywhere the family won't wouldn't hear to have any alteration to anything that he'd done oh. so I thought, well, and it was a nice track, so I thought, well, maybe I could just go over it in um, Portuguese or Brazilian. Mm -hmm. So there's a lovely singer called Monica Vasconcelos mm -hmm. who lives in London. So she helped on the phone. She helped to talk me oh. <laughs> through how, the pronunciation. how to pronounce yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, you know, like she said, oh, uh, you know, Ellis. Regina May sings, sort of, Já conheço espaços dessa estrada. Shep, but that is really Rio. Well, you don't do that, you know, you just keep it straight. Um, anyway, she, she helped me. Um, I had to miss some out because my English words were not, didn't fit the exact uh, shape. Oh, yeah. Of, so, uh, anyway, but... but uh, so I just went over what I'd done. So we kept the track and I just went over it with these, with my Portuguese effort. That's good. <laughs> and you were talking about um, improvisation. I feel that's really something important for you. So yeah. um, when you work on improvisation, how, how do you work? So do you do, you do it like very instinct, instinctively or is it, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it is really instinctive. I mean, it, it's what it was from the beginning. Yeah. Um, because I didn't know there was any other way you could do it. Mm -hmm. um, of course, now I know in schools they, they, they teach you about the chords and, you know, singing like the thirds and the fifths mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm. you know, leading notes. And, um, but I, by the time I probably could have approached things in that way. I had already been a long time doing my own form of yeah. improvisation and I'm sure it could improve, but I think now it would kind of hold me back if I then had to think course, about what yes, I yes, can yes. sing on this particular chord. Yeah. Um, and uh, so yes, it's, it is instinctive. But I, I think whatever you do, whether you're working on knowledge um, mm -hmm. or, or whatever, you have to be able to hear in your head where the piece is going. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just, yeah. you know, it's like a, a whole um, sequence that you need to know in, inside you, your, your, you know, your, your head. You need to know where you're going, you need to hear it just in yeah. advance, mm -hmm. everything you're doing. And that's really comes from either if you play the piano, you know, familiarizing yourself with the, yeah. with the shape of where it's going. And that would work. I mean, you could maybe play on the piano what you could sing and, and give you some ideas. But that's, that's not the way I've ever worked. I, I've listened to the way people that I know like people like Kenny, he has an extraordinary, had an extraordinary way of, of improvising. You never knew where he was going to finish. Okay. The line would go and you think, oh, it's going to finish there and it just goes around the corner and finishes somewhere else. And I love that. And I, I, I never liked the idea of 
even you know you see like four bars and four bars four bars whatever it is it's to me it's it, it should be like constructing a new melody mm -hmm. yeah over and it sounds like that when you improvise it's so natural and well the thing is i started improvising mm -hmm. with words you see and i oh. i used to stick i used to take the words and improvise a new melody yeah using the words pull them around a bit mm. that was my starting point okay and that's what I was doing really for a while until I started doing these things with Michael Garrick when I started not using words. Mm -hmm. But then I just, it was one chord, and, but then it got more, you know, more complicated. Yeah. Um, and um, and I, I, you know, I, I don't know. That's, that's the way, it's all sort of sound and, and instinctive. I mean, the funny thing is when I did my first ever broadcast which was nine, April 1967. I had already been at Ronnie Scott's for a month in yeah. November 1966. But it was really difficult to get a broadcast on the BBC. And I kept trying and eventually they gave me one, which was an audition. You know, mm -hmm. they, they tell you afterwards whether you pass. <laughs> um, and I sang Joy Spring and um, Softly as in a Morning Sunrise and Out of This World. Mm -hmm. um, and it went out and this guy that I was involved with rang. He found that Carmen McRae was in London. And he found out where she was staying and, and rang her. I mean, I never would have done it, but... <laughs> and he just said, you know, my girlfriend, really, she's a singer and she loves your singing and she'd love to meet you. Oh, wow. And she said, what's her name? So he told him. She said, yeah, well, I want to meet her. She said, I was in, in bed in the hotel last night and I put the radio on and she was on. Oh, that's amazing. I, I mean, they used to put out jazz about mid, between midnight and one o'clock. Oh, that's incredible. On Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. Uh, um, and it was all, you know, like new music or mm. you could do what you wanted. And I had these three songs. It was about 12 minutes altogether. The, recording and she heard it I mean I can't I, I couldn't believe that and she said yeah I want to meet her so I met her and we did an interview mm -hmm. for Crescendo magazine but I don't know whatever happened I think I lent the magazine to someone and I never got oh. it back so I don't have the interview but she was great you know and she said now you play the piano and I said well not really. She said, yeah, you do. I said, well, I mean, I learnt the piano, but I don't really improvise on the yeah. piano. She said, you, you have to. She oh, said, okay. you have to, you, you, I don't believe you. She said, you have to be able to. She said, because of the way you were singing on Joy Spring, you have to know. And I thought, well, <laughs> I don't know, but I couldn't convince her that I don't know. I didn't know. It's true that when, when we listen to you improvising, we have this idea that you exactly know where you go well I do with my yeah, ear but like more um, consciously and um, yeah so you have incredible ears well I think I and do. feeling yeah. and yeah <laughs> I've quite good ears yes. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah well, but, but that was really funny but um, and do you prefer yeah. to sorry no no what, do you prefer to improvise on on modal or on chord progressions, or do you have something that really uh, that you like the most? Well, I mean, modal is, is easier, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's a bit limited after a while. I can't, I haven't got enough ideas outside mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to go outside the chords and come back. Um, that was that. I, yeah, it, it's kind of extraordinary. Obviously, when really there are sometimes really difficult. Mm. sequences which I probably wouldn't attempt to improvise on um, because I think it has to feel it has to be something you want to yeah, you think you course. can add something to what yeah. is the point otherwise mm. um, and yeah so so I, I don't feel it's necessary to improvise on everything anyway no um, even though I like doing it mm -hmm. I don't 
I don't enjoy improvising on things that are so difficult that I'm mm -hmm. having to mm -hmm. think, oh, 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 where's this going? Or it doesn't feel natural. Um, but, you know, like Kelly Wheeler's uh, progressions always felt natural to me. Yeah. And John's. It's just that I suppose I kind of grew up with them. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. yeah, they it was make sense your, yeah. to me. Um, that's lucky. Because people often say, oh, God, it's so difficult. Now we do gentle peace, for yeah. instance. It's so very, very difficult. They're easy, those chords. They're really easy. <laughs> um, you know, 11th, which he used, he liked a lot. Yeah. Um, um, and, uh, but they just, to me, they're logical. And I think, I think they are. They are to most musical people. If you listen really, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a few times, you know, you, you, yeah. they are logical. But they're not what you would have heard perhaps before all the time. It's true. Yeah. yeah. What is your relationship now with your voice? Do you, and do you, do, do you feel, do you feel uh, that your voice is changing through the years? Do you feel a change or um, is it really? Well, it's, it's changed. I mean, oh, yeah. naturally, I think mm -hmm. it's got lower. Yeah. And I haven't quite got all the high notes. They weren't wonderful notes anyway, but, you know, I could squeak yeah. a, a B, top B, not quite the C. But um, that it, it was, I could use it sort of effectively mm -hmm. in certain situations, you know. Um, but, and now, I mean, I still do have some quite high notes, you know, so I can maybe do A's, even a B flat. It depends on the day, you know, where you know what voices are like. Um, but I think problems are always different, always changing mm -hmm, with the voice mm -hmm. because you live with it and it's part yeah. of you. So if you're emotionally upset or anything like that, it, yeah. it's, I mean, I, I went through a period of losing my voice quite a bit and um, in oh, I suppose maybe 15 years ago or mm -hmm. maybe more and um, I didn't know what it was but but actually I think that it was emotional and my brother was very ill and he mm -hmm. died and mm -hmm. I was you know I was desperately unhappy about that losing him and um, but I went to, and, and I had some uh, manipulation of the yeah. larynx which was fantastic. Really? Mm. And, and they found that my, my larynx had, had just tilted slightly to the left. And he said, well, that's okay, because we can do something about yeah. that, you know. Was it an osteopath or? He was, he's an oste osteopath, and he was also a psychotherapist. Okay. So put those two together and you get psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <And I was. laughs> But, um, yeah, so, no, he was, it was wonderful. Um, he's still around. His name's Jacob Lieberman. He's Israeli. And uh, my a, a, an ear, nose and throat specialist sent me to him because he couldn't see anything wrong. Okay. He looked at my vocal cords and said, no, there's nothing I can see uh, that's wrong. So it must be mechanical, which is good. Yeah. Because we can do yeah. something about that. And so I went about three times at, oh, It hurt like crazy because uh, he kept saying, I'm sorry, is that hurting? And I said, of, of course, yes. of course it's hurting. He said, no, it wouldn't hurt if, if you weren't tense, if the muscles mm. weren't tense mm. at the back. Anyway, I, I noticed about three months later, well, I, I had to do a recording immediately after the first okay. session, and that was okay, I managed mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, but about three months later, I thought, Well, I felt free. The voice felt free. I didn't seem to have, I wasn't clearing my throat a lot. And it was, it was good. And, and it went for years, I think about nine years or so before I went back to him again for something. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, well, actually done very well. There was nothing, nothing that it didn't hurt. Okay. But recently I went to his assistant because he was away. Yes. Because earlier this year, I, It wasn't that I was losing, well, yes, actually, I did lose my voice, but I had a terrible cough. 
I'm coughing so much that I think it, it my vocal cords went into a sort of spasm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't I couldn't sing and I, his this guy's assistant um, manipulates you know she yeah. they, she gets her hands right in around the back oh, it must be and so it painful hurts. yeah it really hurt and that's how I knew that that yeah. was a problem okay it, it, because it wouldn't hurt otherwise it was okay I, she said yes they've gone your, your vocal cords are not vibrating properly you've gone into spasm but from coughing yeah. too much um, anyway I, I, I went once and it was finished I, I mean my voice wasn't perfect but I had to do some gigs and gradually it came back and it's okay but I, I want to go again because I feel a bit <coughs> I seem to have a lot of mm -hmm. phlegm and I don't know whether that that helps the, the manipulation but it seemed to all those years ago but my voice is only changing in that um, I mean I can still seem to do the same things with it but the area of the break has changed oh yeah it's dropped mm-hmm by about a tone, yeah, maybe tone and a half. So that is a different area of problem. So certain things, songs which didn't have a problem now do. But okay. I find I can work around it if if mm -hmm. I, you know, I know you know you get to know your voice and you know what you have to, the kind of sound you have to make, yeah, so that you don't get a. Uh, you know, <laughs> So, like a teenager. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, I don't know, That that's all I've noticed. And people tend to say that my voice still sounds young. Mm -hmm. Still sounds a, yeah, much, it's true. a young voice, considering yeah. how old I am. Um, so I don't know how long that's going to go on. But I keep it thinking... It can last I'm, forever. Well, no I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. I keep thinking I, there's things I should record before suddenly... It's going to go. No, it's know. not going to go. Don't think like that. No, well, I, <laughs> I don't think it is, but but you never know. I mean, people's yeah. voices do go. Mm -hmm. I mean, f you find it vibrato. You have a little bit more vibrato mm -hmm. than before. But I can can still control that. Yeah. I don't have to have the mm -hmm, vibrato, mm -hmm. but it comes in a bit more easily than it did before. Um, so you have to make more of a conscious effort if you don't want it. Yeah. And do you work a lot on technique or not really? No. Um, I just, when, it, when I know I've, I have something to do, then I, you yeah, know, I will. You work on a specific yes. project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I like to work like that on yeah. something specific to get the technique for the whatever I have to do. Yeah. But I know that's probably not really the right way. Mm -hmm. I mean, would think opera singers they have to they have to be keeping up their technique the whole time because they never know what they're going to have to sing i mean they sing so many different kinds of things yeah. whereas i don't really you know mm. um so i but i guess i worked to take out a technique for the music i wanted to sing mm -hmm. and that's it really um well it's working perfectly like that so. well yeah, so far. Touch wood. <laughs> touch wood. And um, do you feel close to other um, to other European singers? Um, close in, to in them. The, in the style. And in the uh, well, I only well, I, uh, to begin with, of course, I didn't know what other singers were about mm -hmm, when I started mm -hmm. doing what I was doing. I didn't know if there were other people. Doing it, and then of course I came across Vocal Summit, and there was Jay Clayton and Ursula Dujak, um, and they had been for many years mm -hmm. doing wordless things and and experimental things, and I felt, and of course Jay is American anyway, but yeah. um, Ursula's Polish, and I could feel and a sort of affinity with that, but it must have been it must have been something in the air at the time. It was time for a change, I think. Yeah. Time for something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were people all over the place doing it. And now, of course, there are a, a, 
a lot more, you know. And of course, I came across you Mar opened Maria you. Pia. No, I'm sure I didn't. She was with your friends. She was doing. <laughs> but um, so I, yeah. So I do feel an affinity. And then there's of course people like Maria Joao mm -hmm. who are doing something quite extraordinary. But <laughs> she's extraordinary anyway as a performer. Yeah, that's um, true. And the voice goes along with it. And uh, but I still feel I still love um, songs, and I love singers, and I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't feel particularly. Oh, I'm so glad that that they're all doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm interested when I, I hear it. And, um, oh, there was a singer I was going to talk about, Tamara Lukasheva. I don't know if you know her. No. Well, she was in a competition, and I, I had to choose out of the 12 groups they sent me, yeah. playing three pieces each. I had to choose three groups okay. to do a concert. And then, fortunately, the audience voted for the winner, not me. Okay. I was there. I had to be okay. there, and it's interesting because she. Uh, the, the thing is, I don't like experimenting for the sake of it, for being different. Mm -hmm. As long as it's musical, there's something musical, a musical thread, and in what she does, there, there seems to be. You know, she sings things that sound a bit like Brazilian, and, and um, but. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's music. And, and of course, I, I feel an affinity with European music. Yeah. Um, and I think that it had a lot of influence on jazz. You know, when you think about Bill Evans' chords, you know, on, on Miles' is, you know, that, that recording, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That he, the, the tracks he's on in Kind of Blue, that comes from, it comes from the, the, the Impressionist yeah. European harmony. We're well, same mm -hmm. with Herbie Hancock mm -hmm. and, and Funny Valentine. You know, his his playing is, it's, it's more from Europe than mm -hmm. say from Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But of course, rhythmically there was, of course, it's all a mishmash anyway. It's, <laughs> it's supposed to come from somewhere, but you can't expect things to stay, the same. No. Um, and for me, I don't care what it is as long as, as long as it's music that touches me. You know, it can be from anywhere, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be jazz, but it has to have that element of a freshness, of feeling that somebody's trying to do something. Um, yeah, I mean, I like all kinds of people. Like I, I like Randy Newman and mm -hmm. Joni Mitchell. I mean, everybody likes Joni Mitchell. Now. Everybody in jazz <laughs> um, nowadays. Um, but I still, you know, and I, I love to hear, I love to hear you, I love to hear what Thank you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very and, much. Um, and it's, it's, it's really interesting. You know, people, of course, they're, they're trying. Like, I was trying to do something to get outside that mm -hmm. straight jacket of how you're supposed to do this or do that. It wasn't that I was thinking, I've got to do something. It's just I wanted, I wanted to do something else, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Not just for it to be different, it's just I wanted to, I knew there was something else that I could do. It wasn't just what I'd started off doing. Mm -hmm. and, and I was fortunate that I got the chance, you know, to, and I met the pe right people to do it with. And, I, and uh, the conditions just happened to be favourable for me. Yeah. Then. Now I think it's different but uh, but people I'm there are such good musicians about mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and of course they're all meeting and and perhaps not getting the chance to just go and play in pubs like I I did but they they play together at yeah at the colleges yeah um but it's all about playing it's, it's I mm -hmm. think it's mm -hmm. you've got to get out there and and play yeah and sing out there you know um to do it you can't just work to a point where it gets, you know, oh, it's, it's perfect now, it's ready, so I can go out and perform yeah, it. I think yeah, you just yeah, have to yeah. get out there and try and yeah. perform it. And um, 
you know, and gradually learn from that. And uh, I hope that that's... I tell you one thing that I, I, I'm not too happy about that they do at a lot of colleges is, is they treat the voice like a second class saxophone, you know, making people do all these, jump through all these hoops and sing through all these changes. And I think, well, okay, I know it's good that singers now are educated and mm -hmm. now know how jazz works. Yeah. And, and you know how you can get from this change to that change and, mm -hmm. but I just hope that the singing of a song doesn't get lost yeah in all that because that's what reaches people mm -hmm. in the end mm -hmm. I think oh, they love a, a bit of wild sort of crazy stuff yeah experimentation especially young people but I think what always gets through is a song. Yeah. You know, where I was <laughs> just listening the other day, because uh, Jackie Dankworth was here and she sang a Beatles song, I Will. Da 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 di da da da, do do da di da di, da da di da di da di da, if you want me to, I will. And I thought, it's such a, a perfect little song. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's pleasing. It's. Mm -hmm. You know, and listen to it all the time, but you know, it's it's what touches people. And it's what why they were so big because they managed to write things that got across to people. Okay. But stating the obvious there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you got to you have to have a melody, I think, somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I mean, when you listen to say Keith Jarrett's improvisations, they're all melodies. Yeah. Kenny's were all melodies. It's true. Yeah. And of course you get the odd sort of experimentation yeah. and the uh, sounds and squeaks and God knows what. <laughs> but, um, but really, it's, when it comes down to it, what communicates to me often is mm -hmm. something that's a, a melody relating, coming out of the chords that I'm listening to. Yeah. all I have to say. That's perfect. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. That's no. Thank you so much, Norma. That's thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank oh, you. It was enjoyable. super interesting and I really learned a lot. And <laughs> thank you. No, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. Good. I'll give you a kiss. Mm. Two. Two. Oh, no, it's two better than one. Three, isn't it? No. Oh. Two. One is oh, okay. Oh, Switzerland is <laughs> <laughs>